that's sort of for the basic geologic information, um, there is a common denominator that we can all use that would simplify life both for, for, from our point of view as data deliverers, but more importantly, make it easier for the data consumers to get and use data. So the, the end objective is that to do simple things like just get a map up in your GIS project or in a, in a web map application so that somebody can see, get a basic idea of what the geology is and, and know, get some information about what kind of rocks are where and how old they are. It should be simple to do something simple like that. So the goals that we've got here, are we want to be able to share this basic simple data, simple profile of, of geologic information using a single interchange format. We want to use the same words in the data that get, that's provided from different providers but just for a couple of important properties, which to start with we're promoting would be the idea of what the, the um, categorization for faults and contacts and um, the categorization for lithology and age of geologic units. And of course, age is already standardized pretty well because we've got the geologic time scale. Um, but the idea would be to all use the same version of the time scale or um, in case that makes a difference. We want to display data using the same symbolization scheme. And ideally, we'd like to get these service, services for the state maps, at least, um, registered with One Geology to start evolving a, a real One Geology US. And we'd also like to get the, the uh, data sets and services registered in the US GIN catalog to make them part of the, the geoscience information network. So that's, uh, that's the, the goals we have. I just wanted to briefly look at a couple of examples of existing systems that are doing um, something along the lines of what we'd like to, to um, achieve here. So I'll switch over to, we can do this. So let's see, I've got two things, one of which is the um, One Geology Europe, which you may or may not be familiar with. Let's see if this is Okay, so this is um, a project that was completed last year or maybe the year before um, among a bunch of countries in Europe with the intention of, of developing you know, pretty much exactly what we're talking about here. They wanted to have web map services from all the countries that were using the same portrayal scheme for um, age and lithology so that it was possible to bring in data from these different services and have a, a a slightly at least harmonized view of the geology. So you can see these are coming in live at this point. It's not especially fast because the internet, internet wireless in the library here is not particularly um, powerful. But anyway, let's just zoom in somewhere. So the idea is, is these maps are all coming from the different geological surveys in Europe. And what they've done is they've set up their portrayal schemes using the same um, lithology categorization for the rocks so that you can look at, at the, um, you know, you can hear, I think we have Austria and Germany next to each other. And you see, for the most part, there's no humongous discontinuities, although, of course, there are a few places where, where the lithology was categorized a little bit, was categorized differently across borders. So this, this kind of approach doesn't solve all the problems, but it does allow you to at least get, have different map services from different providers that you can put up next to each other and come up with a, a a more coherent map, a, a map that might actually be useful as opposed to if everybody's using their own geologic map color scheme, um, as you know, you, you end up with something that can have some fairly major discontinuities across boundaries between maps that results in a, in a pretty incoherent map. So that's One Geology Europe. This is based on a, a relatively simple profile um, with, with it's very similar to GSIML portrayal. It's actually sort of a precursor for that. Um, and then I also wanted to take a quick look at the um, state geologic map compilation that the USGS Mineral Resources Division did a few years back. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but they went through all the, the state geologic maps for the country and <clears throat> categorized all the units using a, a uh, simple sort of lithogenetic scheme that people refer to as lith class 6. Um, and uh, Actually, this is the geologic map in North America. What I'm going to do now is switch over to 
a compilation of those geologic maps from the state states. So you can see these are coming in as separate states. I've actually gone in. These are all right now deployed as, as web services from the USGS um, in Reston. And, and if you go to the MR data, Mr. Data, if you just Google that, you'll end up on a website that Peter Schweitzer run, runs that has links for all these. Um, they all have a common um, uh, data structure. They, so they're harmonized. And they also, since they, they use the same a map unit scheme across there. When you put the maps up next to each other, again, there are some discontinuities at boundaries. You can see something over here between Wyoming and I guess that's Nebraska or Kansas. Um, there's a, so there's some dis, there are a few discontinuities, but in a lot of cases, those are because of the way the rocks are. Um, one of the, some of the major discontinuities in this compilation happen out here where you go out into the plains and, and whether people map the Ogallala as something different or the Luss and Surficial deposits, different from this Luss and Surficial deposits, you run into those problems. Um, and you can see, you know, situations out here where you get into these interbedded Pennsylvania and Permian rocks or something where, you know, it's sandstone and shale and mudstone and, and they vary sort of continuously. But, but you end up with a map that can be largely homogenized. So this is an ex this actually this Mr. Data compilation has in a lot of ways done what we're trying to do. I mean, in terms of having a, a collection of maps for the whole country available through map services that are using the same kind of scheme. Um, the difference is, of course, right now is these are all being served by the USGS, and they're static, and it's you know it's their interpretation of the geology from the states. And what we're thinking is that, that this would make more sense if the states actually were taking control of their own geologic maps and determining how they wanted to portray them. And in addition, what I'd like to, you know, maybe we can foster is a little bit of thinking about how we might harmonize some of the, the uh, discontinuities between these maps. For instance, you know, the, the map between Nebraska and the other states around it, because the, the, the Nebraska map in this compilation is all based on the bedrock geology. It doesn't doesn't encounter doesn't incur um, include any of the superficial geology. And there's you see other other issues like that around. But again, you can see you end up with a map that's that's more useful than than um, than seeing all the original portrayal schemes. So that's the framework of of where we're heading with this. Um, if you have any questions or comments, like Kim said, you should um, send them in to the chat. Um, are there questions? There is a question um, as to whether or not uh, we will have layer files for geology. Aha, I'll get to that. Okay. Um, we'll talk about symbolization is on, is on the agenda, and that's, that's one of the issues. Yeah, short answer is yes. Anyway, um, so that's that. Let's go back over to the boring word slides here. Oh, went back to the beginning. Sorry about that. No, it's not. It's, there we go. Okay. Just have to be patient. Okay, so that's the mo motivational section. So what we want to finish this workshop with is when you come here, we want you to leave with red with data that are ready to deploy as a one geology WMS and WFS. Um, we want everyone to understand the sort of purpose and scope and content of this GSIML portrayal interchange format and you know something about what its limitations are and what it was designed for, what it wasn't designed for, and uh, why we want to use it. And then the ability to explain to other people what these services are and how to set them up. So um, here's a, our current agenda for the workshop will parallel in a lot of ways to what we're talking about here. We'll talk a little bit about USGIN itself and some background on that. Um, we'll outline the goals of the workshop. Then we'll talk about the map services in general, review sort of what WMS and WFS are all, around, all about, the GSIML portrayal scheme. And that's all, you know, that'll be in the first couple hours in the first day. What we'd like to spend most of our time working on is actually working with the data that, that you bring to the workshop to look at how it maps into the GSIML portrayal scheme, into the interchange format. 
And so the data mapping will take up most of the, the uh, most of the latter part of the first day or the afternoon of the first day and probably some of the morning of the second day. And once we actually start getting some, some data sets mapped into the interchange format, what we'd like to do is actually deploy some services. So we're hoping that at least some of you come with the ability to access your servers uh, from, from the internet there at the survey. And we actually, we're still in the process of trying to work out the details with the USGS about having outside network access because things are buckled down fairly tightly there. But if, if nothing else, we might actually have a little server running GeoNetwork or something there or, or an Amazon server somewhere. We'll figure out something. But the idea is to actually be able to, to deploy at least a few of these services so we can, we can see the product. Um, and then the other thing that has to be done is, is thinking about the metadata because it's one of the key things for making this stuff useful is it has to be discoverable. And to be discoverable, it has to have good descriptions of what it is, and those have to be accessible through some catalog somewhere. So we'll also talk about metadata. So that's the agenda for, for the workshop in, in May, um, what to expect when we get there. Um, today, then, I wanted to now dive into some of the stuff about some of this background issues. Um, so just a quick review. Hopefully, this is not, none of this will be new for you, but I just wanted to run through some basic ideas about how these, how geologic map databases are set up, at least in the, the ones I've seen over the years. And so the simplest setup is just a flat file format. And this is where you have sort of, for geologic units, you have one polygon file. It has a, there's an identifier for each polygon. The shape is the geometry field, whatever that is. Um, generally, it's some kind of binary blob that you never have to deal with except using the editing tools in your GIS software. And then there'll be something like the name of the unit and, and maybe some other kind of uh, description. That didn't get changed. Anyway, um, maybe some, some lithology terms to categorize the unit, something about the age of the unit, what kind of unit is it, maybe some source information. And you know these, these vary from place to place, but the, the basic idea is they're all in one file. Each record. Um, each polygon that's assigned to the same unit will generally have pretty much the same thing in all these fields. So it's a denormalized field. There's a lot of duplicated information. But all the field values are in, are in text, generally. So it's very easy for somebody to open this thing up. And when they do an information click on a polygon, they get text that, that a person can read and understand. So everything's in one table. There's no foreign keys, so there's no linked tables in this setup. And the property values are all in, in text or numbers. It's pretty clear. It's a real simple setup. And, and this is pretty much what shape files do. Um, and it also, as it happens, is very pretty much what's in GeoSIML portrayal. It's a flat file scheme. Um, at the next level up, a lot of, there's this a lot common pattern where people will have geologic unit polygons that just have the identifier and the geometry, maybe something about the source of the polygon. But there's an identifier for the map unit that crops out in that area, which links that polygon then to a table that has a description of the map units. So on a typical geologic map, there might be you know, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 units, who knows. But the idea is you have one table that has all those unit descriptions in them, since it's the same for all the polygons assigned to that unit. And you have a join between that description table and the geologic unit polygons. So in this case, we have feature descriptions in one table, and there's a one-to-many relationship between the description and the map features. So the map features are the lines and polygons in your map, where the polygons probably represent outcroppings of geologic units, and the lines are, are faults and contacts. So this, this kind of setup, there's one foreign key. It's a property value that identifies a row in a related table, to which, and that's called a join. So this is a, a slightly more complex structure, but it allows you to have all your descriptions of units in one table. And this is the, this is the pattern that the, uh, GS, the, the uh, NCGMP09 database uses, for those of you that are familiar with that. At a more complex level, then, we have more normalized databases. And uh, if, if you're using this kind of database, this won't be news to you. But the idea is that, that you have, for instance, in the polygons, there's the identifier for the polygon and its geometry. And then it just has a foreign key that points at the unit description. And maybe another foreign key that points at a table of sources that provides the information on, on where that 
polygon definition came from. But then in the next table, in the description of units table, instead of having lithology and age in there as text, those might actually be identifiers for records in a lithology table, let's say, that then has more information about the lithology. And this kind of configuration allows you to re represent that a particular a, a map unit is not composed of only one rock type. Typically, there will be a variety of different rocks that are, that are constituents in the unit. And this kind of configuration allows you to identify those to say, you know, what kind of parts they are. Is it interbedded? Are they facies? Are they, are they inclusions? Or anyway, and, and the proportions of the different parts. And again, for those of you that are familiar with NCGMP09, you'll recognize this as the standard lithology table in that database. You might also have a foreign key that points at a, at a more detailed description of the geologic age. So for instance, you might say that you know, an age is related to some event. You might have a depositional age and a metamorphic age for a unit. Um, for compl complexes, you might have you know, depositional, metamorphic, intrusive ages. But anyway, you can construct a more, more detailed and more information-rich representation of the age in this separate table. And then all of these might have foreign keys that point at some table of sources that's used in all these places. So this is a more normalized structure. And the, the issue here, here you have lots of tables. There's lots of foreign keys, which means if somebody looks at a table, all they generally will see will be a bunch of these opaque identifiers that might be you know, uh, integers or GUIDs or funny looking strings of some sort. But they don't make, generally make much sense to people. And, but the benefit is, is that the information, the facts, are only stored in one place. And this is sort of the goal of the relational database design. So this is a good scheme if you're dealing with data management and maintenance, that you don't have duplicate copies of the same information in a lot of different tables. That means if you have to update something, you can update it in one place, and that cascades to all the other things that reference that. So this is a more normalized structure. So what we'd like to know is what kind of database do you have? Um, so um, you know, we ask that everyone be prepared to come to the workshop with some kind of data. So what we'd like you all to do is tell us in the, in the webinar chat um, a little bit about what your database looks like. So what kind of file format are you using? Is it a shape file, a personal geodatabase, file geodatabase, something else, PostGIS, who knows what. And also, importantly, what kind of data structure sort of in, the, in that framework I just talked about? It, is, it, is it a flat file format? Do you have one unit, map unit table? Or is it a more relational multiple table kind of scheme with, with, multiple, with multiple joins? And so we'll use that information in planning the workshop, because what we'll probably do is break up into work groups, trying to group people together who are dealing with, with the same kinds of file formats and the same kind of data structures, so that, that uh, it'll be easier. People will be able to help each other out, because they're dealing with similar issues. So please, please respond in the chat. Let us know what you've got. And that'll be very useful. So anyway, so that's the uh, data structure section. I wanted to briefly look at, at the resources we've got um, that I would like for everyone, hopefully, to have a look at before they come to the workshop about the interchange format and the process for deploying the services. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is flip over to Excel here. And what we've got is this thing that we're calling the um, So we do have a few questions while you're switching. Oh, OK. Over. Um, Questions. One is it's more of a comment, and it seems that a real challenge seems to be getting states to host their own data while reducing discontinuity. And uh, my answer to that is that's what we're having this workshop for. Right, and well, and I, as I, if I mean that, so the discontinuity is between the services from different states and different maps. I mean, they have a, there's a variety of different reasons that you get those map discontinuities. So there's of course the, the basic geologic issue that people map things differently. Um, some people focus more on the superficial deposits. Some people might be more focused on the bedrock deposits. If you're in metamorphic rocks, some people are focused on the protolith. Some people are trying to map metamorphic bases and are folk looking at its metamorphic rocks. There's all kinds of issues you have where there are gradational facies changes across a region. You know, it's Someone who starts on the limestone end of the spectrum maps something that becomes limestone inter interbedded sandstone you know, for a long ways, whereas somebody at the other end of the spectrum who's starting in the sandstone unit might call things sandstone.
for a long ways, and then you end up with a, a boundary where what you've got is interbedded sandstone and limestone. There's all, so there's geologic reasons for those discontinuities, and, and those are you know we can't solve those problems in this sort of environment. Those are geologic problems, and people probably have to go out in the field and look at it and, and talk about it, try to figure out what makes sense. But what we can solve is the issue where if, if there's two adjacent maps and there's a granite unit on both maps at the boundary that, that on one side it isn't colored green and on the other side the same granite unit is colored red. We can, we can get around those kinds of discontinuities by, by trying to use a more standardized symbolization scheme. And uh, that's, there's a whole, there's a whole you know, bunch of stuff around that. But for now we're just trying to do a, a real simple thing which is the idea that you just have to pick one representative lithology for your unit, and I know that's painful, and it's one of those hold your nose and, and pick in a lot of cases. But but it sort of is, is a starting point, and that's what we're trying to do is get the ball rolling to just get people thinking about these sorts of, of data integration issues on the, on the data provider side. Which I guess uh, brings us to the next comment, which is that Michigan has a bedrock map and a superficial geology map. Uh, because they have 95% glacial deposits uh, covered with the official map is really different than the bedrock map. Right, that makes good sense. And that's, of course, true in, in the whole swath of states across the, you know, from Maine to South Dakota. Um, and, you know, I don't think, uh, I could go back to that, that Mr. Data compilation. Yeah, so ideally, this, this gets to one of the, well, I, get me started talking about geologic maps here if you're not careful. But um, there, there's this question of what's the map horizon that, we're, that you're representing. And so on the one hand, you might represent what's at the surface, in which case you would focus on the superficial deposits. And in a glaciated terrain, you'd have a map that would mostly be about the glacial deposits. You might focus on the bedrock surface. And then in that case, you would you know, sort of ignore the fact that there's this glacial cover or something like that and focus on what are the hard rock units underneath the glacial deposit. And, and for, for this exercise, I'd say um, right now the, the geologic map of North America is a bedrock map. And the Mr. Data compilation, I believe, also uses the bedrock units. And so if you have a choice between doing the superficial units or the bedrock units, I'd say let's, let's try and pick the bedrock maps for now. Um, but recognizing that I feel one of the points of this exercise is to learn how to do this. And what I'm hoping is that after running through it with one map, um, people will understand that it's really not that heinous an operation to do. And, and they'll be eager to, to start cranking, it, cranking out services with all their other maps. That's the, that's the fantasy. So if you have a choice, bring the bedrock map. Any other questions? Um, the most of the other comments are um, geodatabase uh, updates, so I'll copy those down. OK. All righty, so this is, the, this is a, a workbook, an Excel workbook that we refer to as the GeoCIML portrayal template. It's, for lack of a better name, but the important thing here is, is uh, as you run through here, there's a bunch of tabs that, with the idea of providing places to compile information that might, will be useful for setting up the service. So when you deploy the service, you'll have to have some source citation and contact information. And it, it would be useful to put that in, in this workbook. Um, then getting down into the actual geology part, what we have is, is the GeoCIML portrayal scheme has a geologic unit. They're called views, and we can talk in detail about where these names came from. But for the time being, I don't want to get too hung up on the, what they're called. But the idea is there's the geologic units, which are the polygons for the outcrops of the geologic units. There's contacts that represent the depositional intrusive, the non-faulted boundaries between the units. And then there's shear displacement structures, which are faults, ductile shear zones, other, other movement zones that are represented as lines on the map. So there's a, there's a table view tab for each of these. And ideally, we want to have example data in here. Right now in this workbook, we only have the example loaded, data loaded for one geologic unit um, feature. Hopefully, we'll be able to add more to that as we go. You know, well, we will add more to that as we go along, but, but it's not there right now. The important thing, I think, that, that I'd like to look at here today is uh, we have these field list views. 
And this is probably where you want to start in understanding what's in the scheme. Because what this is is just a, a table that has a list of each element in the interchange format and what the data type is. So there's sort of a logical data type, something's a URI, it's free text. The term means it comes from a controlled vocabulary, ideally. And then the implementation is how it's implemented in the XML interchange format. So if it's a string, it means it's a string of arbitrary length. If it's a string 255, it means it's a string that has to be less than 255 characters. And the other important one, and another important one is the cardinality. So if the cardinality is 1, that means a value is required. And for most of these, um, well, let's see. So for the identifier, and we actually should make this clear here, this is a useful thing. Um, really, everything has to have a unique identifier. So that's required and not millable. In other words, there has to be some kind of useful, useful identifier in there that uniquely identifies each feature in the data set in the context of that data set. And for, for the time being, that's enough. For a lot of these URI things, the identifiers down here at the end that are there for the interoperability, for the, for the uh, harmonization between different data services, there are things that are, that are mandatory the cardinality is one, but they're knowable. In other words, if you don't know um, what the geologic unit type is, which seems more likely, but it's possible, um, you can put in a, a nil identifier in there, and I'll get I'll show you where those values are later. So there's there's mandatory knowable and mandatory not knowable, and we need I'll I'll go in and edit this template so that it's clear which which are which. But the other thing that, that uh, we're adding in here is, um, so what we'll do, and you might start thinking about before you get there, is, is that if you run through each of these field lists for each of these feature classes, what would be really useful to do before we get to Denver would be to think about, OK, so the interchange format asks for a name. It's optional. But do I have something I can put in there in my existing data? And so the idea of the name is it's a human, you know, something for people, the people can look at to identify the feature as opposed to the identifier, which is for computers to use to identify the feature. So the idea would be as you look at each one of these fields and you think, oh, I have a field of that that I can use for that. And so what, what you could do is in this mapping notes column that will appear in each of these field list sheets, it wouldn't be there now if my machine hadn't crashed yesterday. Um, is there'll be a mapping a mapping notes field, and if you just take you know write something down in here about what the fields are in your existing data that you can use to populate those properties in the interchange format. So I won't run through all these fields at this point, um, but I'll just say that that in each one of these feature classes, there's a collection of, of fields that are that are text fields, and those are mostly optional. The data the implementation is a string. And these are these are free text fields for the most part. For some of them, we, we say if you you know we ideally there would be controlled vocabularies, but maybe there's not. And if there isn't, you know, just put what you've got in there. So these free text fields down to this source field in each of the ones are are optional and and are designed to sort of give you a way to account for all the information that you have in your current data structure that you want to present in the interchange document. And then there's this collection of fields down here that have this underscore URI at the end. And these are the things that are in there for, for interoperability. And URI, the idea is these are identifiers for concepts from controlled vocabularies. And we have this collection of, of, of vocabularies that have been developed by the GSIML workgroup um, as a IUGS CGI activity. Um, and so the idea is in these fields, use the controlled vocabulary identifiers. Um, so a lot of the work in the data mapping that we'll need to be doing actually involves looking at the data that you have and figuring out which of these controlled vocabulary terms, in this case for the unit type, for the lithology, and for the age, that you want to assign. Um, also, there's the specification URI. I'll talk about that um, a little bit further down the road here today. There's the metadata URI, which is an identifier for the metadata record, and we'll also mention that. There's another, there's a symbolizing field, um, and we'll get to that um, later on. So that's the, the pattern in all of these feature classes. So here's the contacts. So there's a collection of, of 
the text fields that are designed to capture what you've got down to this source field. And then there's a collection of the interoperability fields. And for the contacts, it's just a contact type identifier. And then this specification, metadata, the symbolizer, and shape. And uh, likewise for structure, you know, the same collection of text fields, although this one has some stuff about movement, the types of deformation style and, and displacement that are unique to false, which is what makes false interesting. And likewise, there's some additional identifiers for the interoperability there. So that's, that's the pattern, and, and please have a look at this and, and read the descriptions of what's supposed to be in the fields and think about, do I, do I have information that I can usefully put in there? Please hang on just one second. Can everybody hear us okay? Can you just send us a quick chat? Yeah, someone mentioned that the sound went out. Oh. Okay. All right, everybody else seems to be hearing. We'll see if it's something on their end. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry for the interruption. Um, one other important thing that's in this workbook, after the last field list here, is there's a collection of tabs that have the vocabularies in them. So you've probably all been sitting there. Well, you, know, you, you want we want you to use these controlled vocabularies. We want to make it easier for it easy for you to get them. So there's a whole this whole collection of tabs back here. These are copies of the, the CGI vocabularies. Um, and for each one, these are the URIs. So the URI is what actually goes in the interchange documents. Um, there's a preferred label, which is the text thing for people to use uh, to identify that concept. And if, if you don't have a controlled vocabulary already, these could be put in the type in the text fields in the interchange documents um, as well. You could use that there. There's a definition, and this is really, this defines what the intention of this vocabulary term is. And then there's some information about where the, where the uh, definitions came from. And a lot of them were, were cobbled together in the, in the course of constructing these CGI vocabularies. So I, there should be a tab here for all the vocabularies that you need to populate any of these documents. Um, this is the ICS, the International Commission on Stratigraphy. So this is the international time scale. We're using the 2000, the August 2009 version of that. Um, they have a sort of policy of kind of continuously updating that, which is really nice if you want all the latest information. But if you're actually trying to make a, you know, a data set, it's important to think about you know, which version of this time scale am, am I using. But what's in here is these, you know, you can see the, the URIs are not too mysterious. There's just, it says it's classifier. It's from the International Commission for Stratigraphy chart, stratigraphic chart, and the, the uh, era names are, are in the URI. So they're designed to be relatively transparent. And one of the other things that we're doing with these URIs, um, it's implemented for the time scale, I hope. Let's see if it'll make a liar out of me. But the idea is, is these should be dereferenceable. In other words, if you take that URI and put it in a web browser, um, you're supposed to get back something that tells you what it means. And so this is what you get for the time scale units right now. Um, this is coming from a server in Australia. So that's all set up and working. And we've got, we've got the service set up for, the, um, for all the other vocabulary URIs, except right now they're using some older, an older scheme we had for the identifiers that used numbers instead of words. And we decided that was just, there was no point doing that. It wasn't very useful. I mentioned the nil values. There's also a vocabulary in here for different kinds of nils. And as you know, there's, there's, so there's inapplicable, missing. Um, those are the two that will probably be of any use. Hopefully no one will be withholding information. Um, and the above and below detection, of course, have to do with geochemical data that aren't really relevant for what we're doing. So that's what's in this template. Um, if you want to find the template online, if you just go to usgin.org, And right here at the top, there's a banner for, the, for this workshop announcement. If you go, um, you can open this Read More link. And down at the bottom is the stuff for preparation. So there's a link here for the, the cookbook. And this is a text document that, that uh, discusses geosimal portrayal. Actually, a lot of what I've talked about today is written down here. And also has a sort of walkthrough for some of the procedures. 
Um, this is, of course, a work in progress, and we'd very much like to get feedback from you all about how we can improve this, um, what works, what doesn't work, what isn't clear, what needs, what needs more explanation, et cetera, et cetera. And then also on this US GIN page, there's a link to that Excel workbook I was just showing you. So that's the content workbook. So um, that's the goodies on that. So that's what, that's what I wanted to say about that. Um, oh yeah, so it's also in this uh, presentation. And I guess this presentation should show up on US GIN as well. Um, so the links are there. We are recording. OK, oh yeah, we're recording. That's good. So this whole thing will be able to be replayed Correct. for your. We have a question as to whether or not there is a sheet for attributes. Sheet for attributes. Attitudes. Oh, attitudes. attitudes. No. Sorry. Yes. Can't read. <laughs> Good question. And and short answer is no. Um, we have not built this thing out to include structured data yet. Um, it's definitely something that's high on my list of wouldn't I like to do that things? Um, but we, we've, for the for the time being, in order to try to you know scope things and keep it relatively as simple as we can for now, we're just doing the faults, contacts, and polygons. Um, but stay tuned for structure data. Hopefully, that will be coming soon to a map service near you. Of course, the big problem with structure data in the map services is that you you have to be able to rotate symbols when you want to display them. If you're using RTIS server, you can do that. And it's fairly straightforward and, and will actually come through in the service. But if you're using any of the open source um, map servers, it doesn't work so well. And so that's one of the reasons why we haven't really chased that one down yet, because the technology, at least in my interpretation, isn't quite there yet um, to do that, be able to do that with the sort of generic free open source map servers. Another question, and perhaps you're about to cover this, but can SDGC compliant metadata be imported to the workbook template? OK. Yes. Well, are there any other questions? Because That's I was all. just about to talk about metadata. All right. So, so as you noticed in the, uh, in the content model there, um, there's a place for a metadata URI. And the idea is that's, again, that's an identifier. Ideally, it'll be an HTTP identifier that will dereference on the web to get a metadata record. If you already have meta FGDC metadata online, you could just put in a URI that would get that record. Um, what we'd like to do in the larger USGIN framework is we're, we're trying to get all the metadata into the USGIN ISO profile. So what, since we're only dealing, I think, with probably 20 or 30 data sets here for this exercise, what we're offering to do is, if you do have FGDC metadata, or any kind of metadata, even if it's just a text text file or a description or something like that, um, what we'd like to do is, is get your metadata record for the data set you'll be working on. And we will put it in the USGIN catalog, at least as a starting point. Um, and then that way we'll have URIs for the metadata records in the catalog that we can put in the uh, in the interchange format documents. So that's what that's what we're proposing. So if you have existing metadata, please email us either a URL or the record itself, and it can be FGDC, ISO, you know, Dublin Core, EML, DIF, you know, CF, whatever. You know, um, we'll figure it out. Probably end up just cutting and pasting the content out of it for the time being. But, but that will give us uh, take care of, of the basic metadata issues. Um, so we'll be ready in Denver. We won't have to spend time in Denver doing that. Um, if you don't have any kind of metadata, if you just can send us some basic citation information and, hope, and maybe an abstract for the data set, we'll construct a starter record for you. And we can, we can work with you. Um, you know, we can have a telephone call or something to, to fill that out a little bit if it needs any more content. So anyway, please, again, um, can you respond in the webinar chat to tell us what, what kind of metadata you have for the data set you were going to bring and what sort of workflow would make sense for trying to get that into the GIN catalog. So that's uh, what I wanted to say about metadata. OK, so the other thing that, that was in, in that content model that may or may not make much sense is this specification URI. And the intention there is this is an identifier for a resource, and I use that in a sort of generic RDF 
Web 2.0 kind of sense. It's some kind of some kind of information resource that gives more detailed information about the feature. So, um, for a geologic unit polygon, that might be in the most extreme case. You might have detailed descriptions for each outcrop area. Um, if a unit is highly variable, or if there's a lot of vari a lot of variability, it might make sense to have some subset of your of your map units the polygons for, uh, for the Escobrosa formation in one part of the map have one description and, and then in another part of the map they have another description. Um, that's one possible endpoint. And this, this description, I mean, I think the general case is probably going to be that, that what we'll point at, what these specification URIs will point at, will probably be some kind of web page about a geologic unit in the, in the general regional sense that can provide more information about that unit than what we can put in this interchange format record. Um, so this, this description could be in any of a variety of formats. When the portrayal scheme was created, what, what we had in mind was that this would point at a, a full GeoSciML XML record that would have all the glorious details about, about the geologic unit or the fault or whatever the feature was that that specification was associated with. But more than likely, for, for what we're doing here, this will point at web pages you might have pictures of the unit or something like that. So the idea is that this gives you a way to point out at a related resource on the web that people can go to that will provide more information about the unit. Um, if it's available, if the units on your map have geolex records in the USGS geologic unit lexicon, um, that's what you know, I would recommend. If we can get geolex um, links in these specification URIs, that would be really super and would help to integrate what we're doing with the, geologic map, the National Geologic Map Database. And that would be, that would be sweet. Um, but what it means is that before you get to the meeting, you might want to sit down and look at the, look at the units on, your, on your, uh, the map you're going to bring and maybe do a little trolling around in geolex. Um, there's a URL for a geolex record here. Um, if you get in there, you can, you can actually you can just Google geolex, and you'll you'll find the, the site for that, and it allows you to search by name, and, and uh, so you can find out pretty quick if, if your units are in there, and if they are, then it would be great if you could have you know just basically get the URLs for for those units and be ready to use those for your specification URIs for your geologic units. Um, likewise with faults, if you happen to have any active faults that, that are on your map, more than likely they're in the USGS Active Fault database. And if you go and, and browse that, I don't have a link for that here, but there's a web page for each of those active faults. And so the specification URI for a fault might point at a web page that had a description of the slip history and the displacement and, and other information about that particular fault. So that's what the idea of the specification URI is. Um, finally, the last thing I wanted to briefly mention was this, the question about symbolization. So we, we do, we have standard color schemes that we'll be using for the representative age. And those colors for age are based on the International Commission for Stratigraphy um, timescale colors. Um, I don't think they're what a cartographer would have come up with, but, but, but there they are, and, and they're, they're fairly widely used in the one geology community. So, so we're using that for the time being. And then for lithology, we have colors, again, that were inherited from the work that was done with One Geology Europe. And those colors are associated with, again, one of this a CGI simple lithology vocabulary. So we'll have those color schemes available as RCIS layer files and a, in a style file. And we also have uh, OGC SLDs, for those of you that know what those are, styled layer descriptor files. It's an XML representation of that color scheme. So those will be hopefully canned and relatively easy to assign um, to your to your uh, map unit polygons once you get the representative age and lithology URIs in, in the data set. The other thing we, that that we'd like to do is, and when we set up these map services, we will actually have three different views of the geologic unit polygons. One of which is based on age. One of which is based on lithology. And the third one is what your favorite color scheme, which we'll refer to as the lithostratigraphic color scheme. So the idea is this would be something that hopefully would, would probably reproduce fairly accurately what, if there's a published version of the map, what that map looks like, um, minus a lot of the cartographic fineness that, that's probably on that map. But 
one thing to be aware of is that, for again, for these map services that we're doing, we want to use solid colors for all the polygons. And the reason for that is, is that, that although there are some map service providers, for instance, in ArcGIS, you can, you can have color patterns. The behavior of, of uh, how those kind of symbol schemes work, if you try to deploy the services on other, other servers, the patterns don't work so well. So just as a general solution for the time being, until the technology evolves a little more, is that I really strongly recommend that, that we just use solid colors for any kind of, of um, lithostratigraphic color scheme that you want to use for your map. So what this means is if on your existing map, in, in the, the, uh, the version of it that you've got now, if it has colors for polygons that use pattern, overlay patterns or dots and lines and things like that, um, you have to, what I'm, what I'm asking you to do is bite the bullet and just pick a solid color for those. Um, which again, it's another one of those hold, hold your nose operations, but it's, it's the, uh, the price of interoperability. Um, likewise for lines, if you're, if you're working an ArcGIS server, um, you can set up, you can use a lot of decorated lines and, and really nice um, cartographic capabilities that will translate into the map service. And that's, that's one of the great things about setting these services up using ArcGIS server. But again, you have to be aware that, that if, if you want to deploy the services using any of the, the free open source servers like GeoServer or MapServer, um, they don't have the same kind of capabilities for doing decorated lines and, and more, more uh, elegant kinds of line, line cartography. So, so to the degree possible, if you are going to use those servers, you're, you're going to need to use solid dash dollar thick and thin line, basically no decorated line. So that's just something to be aware of when you're thinking about how you're going to serve the data and what, what kind of cartographic capabilities you want. So in, in all likelihood, you know, these map services are not going to, are not going to make a map, uh, duplicate what your printed map looks like. But the idea is that, that they're, they're easily accessible in GIS software and and will be useful for a variety of different people in different situations. And I just wanted to say, you know, that we have the Visit the USGIN lab site. Um, we try to keep, actually, a lot of the information about this workshop is actually on usgin.org, not lab.usgin.org. But the lab site has information about the specifications. And if you're interested in WFS and WMS or the GSIML schemes, um, more of the technical aspects of things, this is the place to go. So that was, uh, that's what I had for today. And uh, I look, I'm looking forward to the workshop. I'm really excited about getting some more of these map services online. If you go and browse at the, the portal.1geology.org, you'll see that there are already four states that have, is it three or four? Three, Illinois, Arizona, and Kentucky. Um, so we want to we want to take the next step and actually get those those services set up from more states and using this standard portrayal scheme um, so that they can be if you pay any attention to the the rating system that One Geology has recently come out with instead of being two star services we can be four star services and it will be really super so anyway um, thanks for your time and are, if there are any other questions we can answer those now either take them by chat or if you'd like to raise your hand we can unmute you and come and ask in person. For the workshop do participants need to have a map server set up and ready? Um, it's not essential. Um, we, we prefer that and, and hopefully I mean, we do have the in the uh, we have the hub servers in the geothermal data system, and I think that you know this is something that we can do under the auspices of the, our work with the DOE on the geothermal data system. That if you want to, if you don't have a server available, um, I think it's it should be possible to work with one of the hubs to set your your map service up at least temporarily um, on one of the hub servers. We hope to have a server deployed. At the at the workshop that we can use, if there's no other if there's no other option, and this this is going to be hinged on what the firewall restrictions are at the survey and things, 
um, but but it's fairly easy to run. It might be a map server or a geo server instance running on a laptop there at the at the workshop, or we might actually set it up as an Amazon machine. But but no, you don't actually have to have a server running. But um, but we would you know we would recommend that you have some idea of how you're going to do the service, how you want to do the service in the long run. Um, and for those of you that are on the geothermal project, you know, map data, geologic maps are a great statement of work item for you for this upcoming uh, work year. So if you want to continue to work on these maps and, and get your maps in interoperable formats, that's one mechanism to do it. Before you drill, you need to know the geology. Right. So yeah, so the state maps are the, are the sort of, uh, you know, start, a good starting point, but in from the point of view of the geothermal data system, if there are geologic maps of areas of geothermal interest, those would be particularly relevant at any scale. Depth bedrock maps, well, that's, that's another issue. <laughs> but we can do those, and we want those, too. Um, for data that we bring in, could it be something that is less than statewide, such as a quadrangle or two? Certainly, if that's yeah, yeah. So it's you know it's kind of up to you. I'm just I'm just begging people to bring in state maps because I'd like to get state maps on. In terms of one geology registration, um, their target scale for that is million scale. So probably twenty four thousand scale stuff wouldn't register with one geology, but you might be able to get some hundred k or two hundred fifty k data registered. I don't know if that'd be worth exploring, but it's that's not that you know. The one geology registration stuff is gravy. Um, mostly, we just want to get people, you know, so sort of demystify this process and get start getting more map data online. Hey, there's a question as to when we hope to have this up on the website. This webinar recording, uh, we'll try and have it up on the website by the end of the week. It'll be on uh, YouTube, and we'll post it to the usgen.org and the state geothermal data site. Uh, we also sent out a request, if you do have metadata that you're sending us, please go ahead and send it to Cecilia Coleman by Tuesday, April 24th, so that we have some time to work on it as well. Um, are there any other data that you would like us to bring besides bedrock geology, geologic contact, and fault? Like what? Is, is there other? Is there other? <laughs> let's see. Um, if you have, you know, if you, surficial maps is certainly within scope as well. If that's, you know, if that's higher priority, it's um, just dealing. If you're dealing with the bedrock maps, then you have to deal with the con with faults. Maybe you have faults in your surficial deposits as well. That's, you know, the lithology tends to be a little bit more heterogeneous on a bedrock map. So, it, you know, it's a sort of better teaching exercise because you're dealing with more different kinds of materials, depending on where you are, of course. All set? All right. Hey, well, thanks very much, and I, I look forward to seeing you all in Denver. Over and out. Thank you all for participating.